The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pamela Starte. I work in workforce reliability at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Overview of Open Channel Hydraulics, sponsored by Baywork. Baywork is a consortium of Bay Area water and wastewater utilities all working together to ensure that we'll have the reliable workforce we need to serve our customers and protect the environment. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see a control panel in the upper right corner of your screen. GoToWebinar will automatically default to your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. After logging on, your microphone will automatically be muted. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and try to address as many questions as we can during the short Q&A session in the middle of the presentation and the longer one at the end. Today's presentation will be recorded and will be viewable at baywork.org within the next two weeks. I would now like to introduce Robert Scott, the chair of Baywork Staff Preparedness Subcommittee, who will be the moderator for today's webinar. Hello, Robert. Hi, Pamela, and good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you again to Baywork's webinar on overview of open channel hydraulics. We are so glad to have our presenter, Bassam Kassab, with us today. Bassam Kassab has been working as a hydraulic engineer at the Santa Clara Valley Water District since 2001, first in the Capital Projects Program, then in raw water operations, and currently he supervises the Groundwater Modeling Group, and he leads the Water District's effort to comply with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Bassam is also an adjunct faculty at San Jose State University, where he teaches water resource engineering. His research interests include steady flow and water distribution networks, hydraulic transients, deterministic and stochastic hill slope hydrology, flow of grains, as well as production and inventory management and operations research. And just to give you some additional information about our intriguing presenter, during his free time, Bassam teaches Spanish, which is his fourth language, and he writes screenplays and produces independent films. Isn't he an interesting person? Well, without any further ado, I will turn it over to Bassam Kassab. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Kassab, and uh, I want to say good morning to the people on the West Coast, and if you have people on the East Coast on this webinar, good afternoon or good evening for uh, people uh, all over the world, uh, if you are with us today on the webinar. And now I'm gonna launch the PowerPoint. And I'll start with the outline of this webinar. First, we'll start with the occurrence of open channel flow. And then we talk about uniform or non-uniform flow and steady and unsteady so you can uh, remember what's the difference between them. Then we go into the conservation of mass and energy principles and Manning's equation. And then we delve into other topics uh, like channel capacity and channel design, where you'll get the chance to work on a small problem. And then uh, hydraulic grade line or uh, versus an energy grade line. And maybe here it will be a good time to have a small break for Q&A. Understand that the Q&A in the middle and Q&A at the end. Then we'll go into fluid number, then uh, supercritical and subcritical flows, critical depths, and other concepts. And then we'll uh, go to uh, gradually varied flow, which means non-uniform flow, uh, uh, and talk about some examples. And then we talk about the hydraulic jump. And at the end, we'll talk about the software hackers. And we'll have another chance for uh, Q&A at the end, hopefully. Uh, this uh, webinar is an introduction to open channel flow. That means we are going to 
skim the surface and remember some uh, basics maybe you have seen uh, back in school or if you haven't that will be an introduction for you i'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible but the material is not that easy so try to follow me and at the end if there are some difficult concepts maybe when you look at the powerpoint later that maybe robert is going to share with all the attendees you can uh, examine each concept uh, individually so let's start with occurrence of open channel flow and we are going to start actually with a poll question uh, you don't need more than 30 seconds to answer it so the question is open channel flow occurs in and i'm going to let uh, robert uh, take it from here all right we're going to launch this poll question And we'd like you guys to uh, bring your answers in. Here's the launch. Again, the question is, open channel flow occurs in A, rivers, B, canals, C, sewer pipes, D, A and B, or E, A, B, and C. I see the answers are coming in. Great, great. If you're not sure, just take a shot at it. There are no penalties. <laughs> no penalties. We want to make sure you guys get the most out of this experience. All right, I'll be closing the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Let's let me share the results now. Right. You should be seeing the results. Okay, so I see that 57% of the attendees said it's A and B, that means rivers and canals, whereas uh, only 41% said uh, rivers, canals, and sewer pipes. And uh, Robert, uh, is the majority always right or not? What do you think? Uh, the majority uh, sometimes are right, but some other times are not right. I, I have... The majority gets it wrong. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, actually the answer is A, B, and C. Uh, open channel flow can occur in rivers and canals, which are obviously open to the atmosphere. So you can see why it's uh, open channel. But then in sewer pipes, if they are not flowing full, Many of the most of the time, sewer pipes do not flow full, and when they are not flowing full, on the top of the sewage water there is some air, and that means the flow is like open channel. It's happening like open channel, and that's what we are going to cover in this uh, uh, next few slides. So we're going to see the examples of open channel flow. So let's go into the next slide. Now, does everyone see my next slide? Good. So open channel flow occurs in natural, stream, uh, natural streams, that means rivers or creeks, or in engineered or artificial canals. They are called man-made canals. I prefer to say human-made uh, because they are made by man or woman. And uh, if you don't like the word human-made because it reminds you of aliens, human versus aliens, you can say artificial or engineered canals. But also they occur in flumes. We are going to see examples of flumes. Partially full storm drains, partially full sewer lines, and partially full culverts, like you are going to see in the next few slides. Those are examples of uh, natural streams. On the left side, you see a small creek here. We have it in the San Jose. It's called Karaki Creek. And that's a uh, pretty small compared to the Amazon River on the, on the, on the right side. That's the uh, river in the world with the highest discharge, highest flow. Uh, it's the uh, Amazon River in uh, South America. So those are open channels. It could be a small creek, it could be a very large river. But then you have the human-made canals. On the top left, you see an irrigation canal. Typically, it's a trapezoidal canal, concrete line that moves the water from point A to point B for irrigation. On the right side, you see the California aqueduct. Uh, that's the uh, aqueduct that was built in the uh, 60s, uh, I believe, uh, to bring water from the Sacramento Delta down to Southern California. 
and uh, many uh, irrigation districts take water from the aqueduct. Also, many uh, water districts uh, take water from that aqueduct for the water supply. And at the bottom, we see the Suez Canal. Uh, that's a canal that uh, connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. It crosses through Egypt. Uh, it was uh, built in the 1860s, uh, more than 150 years ago. And the difference between that canal and the California aqueduct basically not just the size, but the Suez Canal has salt water, seawater, whereas the California aqueduct has uh, fresh water. So most canals you see them are freshwater canals, except uh, the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal uh, and few others who uh, have seawater. And flumes, a simple example of flume you see it in a water park, basically water flowing down a uh, uh, plastic flume on the left side. But also flumes have been used historically to move uh, trees, the tree branches, logs, uh, for loggers. They move, uh, they want to move the trees from one side of the forest to another. And if water is abundant, like in Sweden, they construct a flume and they use water to move the logs. And you see flumes in a hydraulics lab. If you have been uh, at a university lab, you see those flumes that are used for experiments. So a flume, again, is an open channel, basically. Uh, it's a small, it's uh, sometimes rectangular, sometimes circular, like the water park, and then it moves water from one point to another. But all, not only in streams and canals and flumes, uh, we see open channel flow. You can see it in a uh, storm drain, sewer line, and uh, culverts uh, when they are partially full. On the left, you can see a circular pipe. Uh, it could be for a sewer line or a uh, storm drain. Down there at the bottom, you can see a horseshoe-shaped sewer in uh, London. It's, they have an old sewer system underground, and you can see the sewage coming out from two places and going uh, on one side. And what you see in the picture is uh, just sewage, but the reason this uh, sewer is very large is that they have a combined system of sewage and uh, storm water. So when they have the storm, that uh, sewage pipe could be half full or two-thirds full. But still, it's flowing as open channel because there is air on the top. And on the right side, you can see the construction of culverts uh, coming from uh, two streets where they're going to meet and go into a third one for storm drains, uh, probably they are. And here in the summary, I want to uh, remind you of the difference between pressurized flow, flow and open channel flow. So open channel flow can occur in a, pipe, a circle pipe or a box culvert, but the water surface is not touching. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you do. The water surface here is not touching the soffit of the pipe. That means the top of the pipe. So that's why you have air here, atmospheric pressure. And that's why the water flows like uh, open channel. Uh, like a stream or a creek or a canal. Whereas on the left side, you have a pressurized pipe and the water is touching the uh, soffit on the top and the water inside here is under pressure higher than what you, it experiences in open channel flow. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what's uniform flow versus non-uniform and what's steady versus unsteady. Uh, basically, uniform and uni non-uniform, when we talk about them, it's about space. Because the water is moving from point A to point B in a pipe or in a canal. And then uh, if the uh, velocity or the depth of water is changing in that uh, open channel, that means it's non-uniform. But if it's constant, so over space, when you move from point A to point B along the uh, channel, and the velocity and the depth of water do not change, that means the flow is uniform. And that's pretty easy, easier to analyze. But when it's changing, it's uh, more challenging, like we are going to see later in this lecture. And the reason it changes, it could be for many reasons. It could be if the channel bed slope changes, that means the velocity and the depth of water is going to change. If the roughness changes, that means in one place, if you have concrete, in another place, you have uh, pebbles and rocks. In a third place, you have vegetation. So that roughness is changing uh, in the channel so will uh, the velocity and depth of water because the condition is non-uniform. And also the sh channel cross-section changes from circular to trapezoidal to rectangular to any natural cross-section. That means the depth of water and velocity will change. That's why we call it non-uniform. 
Now, when we talk about steady and unsteady, it's different. It's not about space, it's about time. If over time, things are not changing at a certain location, that means you have the same flow coming in over time, things are steady. But if you have, let's say, a storm, and in the channel you had some flow at the beginning, but then you had rain, and then uh, the watershed uh, pushed some water into that channel, and then the flow rose into the channel, so will the water depth. So if the water depth changes in the channel, that means the flow is unsteady. So over time, you could have like, you know, one foot of depth in the channel, then after a store, it could rise maybe to 20 feet, then down to 10, 9, 7, 6, until it gets back to one foot. So that means you had a hydrograph passing through the channel, and uh, the hydrograph is unsteady because the flow is changing over time, so will the velocity and water depth in your channel or in your storm pipe, or in your uh, uh, flume, or in uh, whatever open channel type you have. Uh, there are three conservation, uh, conservation principles in hydraulics that are important. The conservation of mass, conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. Today we'll touch only on the conservation of mass and conservation of energy, uh, as they apply here. But all of them apply to pressurized pipes and open channel flow, all three principles. In different cases, we use uh, different principles. So let's start with the conservation of mass. Basically, what it means is in any control volume, the flow in minus the flow out is equal to the change in storage over time. That means change in volume over time. And an example of the control volume is the uh, reservoir on your right-hand side. It's Lexington Reservoir in uh, Santa Clara County here in Los Gatos City in California and it's the second largest, uh, largest reservoir in this county. And uh, co look at the reservoir as a whole, as a whole control volume, like the whole reservoir is a control volume. The reservoir will have some inflow here from uh, rain and runoff. It ends up as inflow in this creek and it enters the reservoir. So if this is your control volume, I'm drawing a circle around the reservoir, and what comes in is the inflow. What comes out is the flow from the outlet pipe or from the spillway. Outlet pipe or spillway uh, allows you to release water from the reservoir. But also you have outflow uh, through evapotranspiration. Evaporation is an outflow from the reservoir. So if the inflow coming in is equal to the inflow coming out, outflow coming out, that means there is no change in storage. The reservoir stays at the same level, at the same volume. So then in this case, this expression, change in storage over time, equals zero, and then you can say inflow equals outflow. Most of the time, inflow is not equal to outflow. If inflow is more than the outflow, larger, you have more water coming in than water coming out, that means the storage in the re reservoir goes up. It's positive, it goes up. So you have more storage uh, one hour later than what you had before. But if the inflow is less than the outflow, that means, let's say, in the summer, you don't have uh, much inflow coming in, but you are releasing water for the fish downstream, that means your storage is gonna drop. It's negative, ds over dt is negative, and then it drops down. And uh, that's basically the idea of the conservation of mass principle. You can apply it to a whole reservoir. You can apply it also to a single point. Let's look at this graph. You have one river coming down, and then another tributary joining in but both of them will end up flowing in uh, the server. And that's why we write Q1 plus Q2 equals Q3. Basically, all the Q in equals all the Q out if we consider this red dot the control volume. Basically, you are saying what's coming in equals what's coming out because in this case, you do not have change in storage. This red dot, the uh, hypothetical dot here, doesn't uh, keep water uh, inside it like the reservoir. So that's why what comes in equals what comes out. And that's the case here when you have steady uh, situation. Uh, when you have steady situation, the storage does not change, so it's equal to zero. That's why you say all the flow coming in equals all the flow coming out, as illustrated in this example. Now let's... Uh, jump to the second uh, concept, which is, which is conservation of energy principle. We use that conservation of energy principle. I'm not gonna write it down the whole equation. We use it to develop the Manning's equation from it. 
And uh, probably if you have taken any uh, course or uh, seminar about uh, open channel hydraulics, you know that Mann's equation is one of the important equations uh, that you have to deal with. And this equation tells us that the velocity is proportional to the hydraulic radius to a certain power and to the uh, friction slope to a power one half, and then inversely proportional to n, which is the friction factor, minus n. K is just a constant. It's one if you are using meters of the international system, and it's 1.486 or 1.49 if you are using feet, if uh, the length is in feet and the velocity is in feet per second. But the rest are expressions that change. Manning's n depends on the uh, roughness in the channel. We're going to talk about it later, different values of Manning's n. Hydraulic radius, I'll define it in a, in a moment. And this is the friction slope. We'll uh, talk about it in a second. The friction slope, basically, it's the slope of the energy grade line, which we're going to talk about in a few slides. But for now, I'm going to say when you have uniform flow, things are not changing over uh, space from point A to point B, then that friction slope, SF, is parallel to the bed slope, so they are equal. So instead of SF, you can use here S0, which is the bed slope. The bed slope is the slope of the fallback, the bottom uh, most uh, lowest point in the, of the channel. That's something you can get from surveying. They know, they give you the uh, elevation of different sections, and then you can find the slope of your channel, at what slope it is. Is it 1%, 1 per thousand, or uh, two per 10,000. So if you know uh, that you can substitute the SF with as zero, and then we know that the flow Q is the area of the cross section times the velocity that's known in hydraulics. If you use that concept here and uh, multiply both sides by A, the area of the cross section of the channel, you get Q here, and here you get k over n, a, rh to a third, and then we replace sf by s0. That's the equation we mostly use for uh, open channel for a uniform case, when you have a constant depth. And uh, let's see, uh, in a couple of slides, we are going to see how you solve this equation. But now let me uh, remind you of Manning's n here that we saw. What are the typical values of Manning's n? There are hundreds and hundreds of tabulated values in uh, different hydraulics books. And uh, Professor Vente Chao was responsible of tabulating uh, these values and everyone keeps on using them. And uh, here I'm only giving you a few examples, showing you for any channel type, there is, there is always a range of uh, Manning's N. He, uh, Professor Vente Chao suggested the middle uh, normal one, but he told us uh, that there is a range, a minimum or a maximum, depending on the condition of your channel. Let's start with this main one, first one. If the main channel is clean, straight, with no deep pools, this is not a concrete channel, this is a uh, earth channel, you end up with a uh, N value could be around 0.03 on average, but it could vary between 0.025 and 0.033. And you can see other examples. If it's a mountain stream, uh, hill slopes, uh, but no vegetation, however, you have steep banks, some cobbles and boulders, you end up with a higher Manning's N. And if it's a flat plain with the dense trees, much higher uh, N value, 0.15. And if the channel is excavated and it has some uh, weeds growing, that's 0.027. But if it's a human-made channel, it's constructed channel, it has cement, uh, it's lined by cement, very neat surface, very good job done. It could be around 0.011, the Manning's end, very low value. But if it's a concrete channel with trowel finish, that means not that smooth, 0.013. If it's corrugated, met, uh, corrugated metal storm drain, it's a metal pipe for storm drain, it's higher, 0.024. Let's see what those values mean. Those values are going to go in this equation here. If you have the same flow and the channel Manning's N roughness changes, if it gets larger, that means the area and the hydraulic radius are going to become larger. That means the depth of flow is becoming larger. So whenever you have, let's say, uh, more cobbles or more uh, grass or high trees in your channel, that Manning's N is going to become higher. So your water depth rises. So for the same flow, if it's passing through a channel and face, it faces more roughness, that means the water depth is going to go higher. 
And that's why we like to keep our channels clean, uh, so to avoid the water depths going higher and to avoid flooding. And you can find the many, many other many, and, many, and online or in other textbooks. Now, I mentioned before the area of the cross-section and the hydraulic radius, but I didn't define them. And here, I'm not going to go through the deri derivation of these or even talking about the more difficult ones like the circular or triangular. I'm going to uh, keep the focus on the rectangular and trapezoidal. Look at the rectangular channel. That's the uh, concrete, let's say it's a concrete channel. And the water surface is at a certain level, Y. That's, that's why it helps you to define the area of the flow. Because when you talk about the area, it's not the area of the channel cross-section. The wall of the channel could be very high, but it's not affecting the hydraulics. What affects the hydraulics is the depth Y here. So the depth of the water is important, as well as the width, the bottom width, uh, BW. So to get the area is simply a rectangle. So Y times BW, it's shown here. Now you need the weighted parameter in order to find the hydraulic radius. Because the hydraulic radius, as shown here, uh, is A over PW. Hydraulic radius is a uh, hypothetical uh, radius. We don't have here a circle to talk about radius, but in hydraulics, in open channel, we talk about the a concept of hydraulic radius. So it's a hypothetical number that comes from the area over, over the wetted perimeter. But you can find the wetted perimeter by looking at this graph here, at this diagram. The wetted perimeter, that means the perimeter of your channel, whether it's concrete or earth, that's touching the water. That means becoming wet. So please do not include the water surface in the wetted perimeter. Don't give me the whole perimeter of the rectangular channel. No, I don't care for that. I care for the wetted part only, which is the base here uh, with width BW, and the two sides with the depth Y, because the water depth goes up to Y only. So that the wetted perimeter is the base plus Y plus Y, that's two Y. So that's the wetted perimeter. And like I said, the hydraulic radius R, or RH, is the area of the wetted perimeter. All right? And the top width, we'll use it later for food number, but uh, I'm not going to need it for a second now. Uh, now, for trapezoidal, it's a little bit complicated. On your own time later, after the webinar, you can do the math and see why we came up with this equation. All right? And uh, for a triangular channel, another set of equations. And for a circular pipe, also another set of equations. But those, you can find them online or in textbooks. Or you can come back to this webinar after, uh, afterwards and uh, see how they were derived. Uh, now, uh, what's a normal depth? A normal depth uh, is not like a depth that the channel has to flow at. The normal depth, first of all, changes with any flow. Any flow values will have a different normal depth. Also, if you change the bed slope or the friction uh, manning uh, roughness coefficient n, the normal depth is going to change. So basically, the normal depth comes from Manning's equation. And like we saw earlier, Manning's equation depends on the flow, on the uh, roughness uh, n, and on the slope of the channel. But then you have the area and hydraulic radius. Those are uh, terms that are written in function of the depth. But when you have uniform flow, if you stay uniform flow, uh, if the flow stays uniform for a while, the depth is going to be at that depth called uniform depth. So some people call it Yn, others call it Y0. So in this uh, webinar, I'm calling it Yn, normal depth. And so the Yn is the depth for steady uniform flow. And you obtain it from Manning's equation. So when you have the discharge Q and the characteristics of the channel cross section and the bed slope too, you can use Manning's equation to find Yn. And after you find Yn, if you are designing this channel, you say, well, okay, uh, at uniform flow, my channel is going to flow at depth Yn. But do you want to design your uh, wall height or your bank height for Yn only? What about a safety factor? In engineering, we always add some safety factor. Uh, in hydraulics, we do add something called freeboard. So you uh, would want to add the uh, 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 freeboard to that when you are designing the channel. So to prevent the channel from overtopping. That's if you are designing uh, the channel, you use Manning's equation to solve for Yn. But if you are analyzing the channel, the last bullet, you have the depth of water that you observe in the field, and you know the cross-section, and you know everything about the channel, like the bed slope and Manning's N, 
use that to find Q. So if you're analyzing the channel, your goal is to find the flow that uh, was in the channel when the depth was at uh, level Y. But if you are designing the channel, you are trying to find that level for a certain flow. And you could be designing for the 10-year flow, for the 5-year flow, for the 100-year flow. So you could have different flows you are designing for. So it depends on the, the company you are designing for, what they want to design for. Now the next slide is going to be another poll question. So you have an analysis problem. You need to use Manning's equation that I'm showing you on the slide. So take a minute and a half to go through this problem. Uh, I am giving you that you have a, a triangular, uh, sorry, rectangular channel of depth BW and, uh, sorry, width BW and depth Y. I'm telling you that the depth Y is two meters and the width of the channel is three meters. I gave you the best slope as zero, which is along the profile, 1%. And I told you that it's a rectangular channel. I looked at uh, child's values and it says 0.013. So now you are gonna please take one minute and a half to use this equation and solve for Q ultimately. But to do that, you need to find A, the area. You need to find the weighted perimeter, then find the hydraulic radius, then plug all these values in this equation with the given N and you should know K by now because I told you what K was earlier. I'm not gonna repeat it and uh, you find Q. And your answer would be A, B, C, D, or E. Take your time, I'm gonna give you one minute and a half to solve it. Well, about done, about uh, to be done here, I'm gonna pass the control to Robert to uh, show you the poll and you can choose your answer from the five answers shown here on the screen. 10 more seconds. All right, I hope you uh, know your answer. I'm gonna launch the poll now and then you can submit, you'll be able to submit your answers to the webinar here. Launching the poll. All right, again, now analyze the problem. What is it? And you can answer A, 4.2 cubic meters per second, six, or B, 6.2 cubic meters per second, C, 42 cubic meters per second, or D, 62 cubic meters per second, or none of the above. Okay, I see some answers coming in. Give you a little bit more time. Appreciate your participation. Okay. All right, I'll be closing the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. And I'm going to share the results now. So I see 43% of the attendees said it's 42. That's the correct answer. Good job. 
if you said uh, 62, that means you use k equals 1.486 or 1.49, which was not the right thing to use in this question because the units are in meters. You would use 1.49 for k when the units are in feet. And if you got uh, 4.2, that means you forgot to uh, do the square root for the slope as zero. Uh, and if you got uh, 6.2, that means you use 1.49 and you forgot the square root. Or maybe you uh, took a shot in the dark if you didn't have the time to solve the whole problem. But maybe when you can come back to this question later, when uh, Robert sends you the slides, maybe you can take the time to solve it. But the correct answer is C42. Good job. Now Robert is going to give me the control again to go to the next slide. Uh, here it is the answer, uh, 3 times 2 is 6 square meters, then the uh, wetted perimeter, you add uh, 3 to 2 times 2, and then you get the hydraulic radius, 0.857, then you plug in the values with k equal 1, because we are using meters, and then square root this part, and 2 thirds this uh, hydraulic radius, and you get 41.6 or 42 meters per second. Now we're having a design problem. Now, the design means you are trying to find Yn. Before, I gave you the depth and you found Q. Now, I'm giving you the 10-year flow. Let's say Q equals 300 cubic feet per second. And your role is to find the depth, normal depth Yn here. Uh, and to do that, let's, uh, I'm, we're not going to do a poll here because it's going to take time to solve this. But you plug in the value that I gave you in uh, minus equation. So you plug in the area which is a little bit more complicated than the rectangular one, and the wetted perimeter, and the hydraulic radius, you end up with the equation like that, 300 equals 1.486 over 0 0.011, etc. You notice the only variable in this equation is the uh, normal depth, yn. But to solve for that, you need either to do that by iterations, basically trial and error. You try a value, then you see if you end up with 300. If not, you... Uh, guess another value, and then you find a smart way to narrow down these values to get to the 300. That's called trial and error. Or you can use a spreadsheet to do that, or you can use your program app calculator if you use one. Either way, whatever you use, it doesn't matter as long as you get the correct answer, which is 2.83 feet. So when you solve for all this, uh, you get 2.83 feet, and that's the depth yn of the water surface in the channel, in the trapezoidal channel. But when we design a channel, we add a freeboard. And it's recommended for trapezoidal channel to add 1.5. Maybe another agency would add 2 or 1 feet. So you have to add that on the top in order to get the uh, top of bank, the depth uh, from the sole wag, the bottom uh, most point in the channel, to the top of bank should be yn plus 1.5, around 4.4 feet. And that's how you are designing your channel. You tell uh, your construction engineer that you need the channel to be at 4.4 feet to allow for that 10-year flow of 300 CFS. Now I'm going to look, uh, go through this slide, uh, explain the concept of AGL versus EGL. Then maybe if there are any questions coming in, we can answer one or two. Uh, so AGL is known as hydraulic grade line, and this is a concept in hydraulics, whether in pipe flow or open channel flow. Here in open channel flow, it refers to the depth of water in the channel, y, plus the elevation of the uh, soul wag, the bottom most point of the channel, to a certain datum. The datum could be a datum you specify, or it could be mean sea level, or it could be NAVD 88, or whatever datum uh, you decide to use. So you have the elevation of the channel from the datum, the soul wag, that means the bottom most point, plus you add the depth, y, so you end up with the hydraulic grade line. You see that the hydraulic grade line is pointing here, the arrow to the water surface in blue, the surface of the water, basically. So the hydraulic grade line always coincides with the water surface. That's how it's defined, because it's the elevation of the channel plus the depth of the water. But when you add the velocity head, which you don't see in the field, it's something you calculate, it gives you the, when you add the velocity head, you end up with the energy grade line, EGL. So when you add the velocity head to that, it gives you the, EGL here. And if your uh, flow is uniform, that means things are not changing along the channel, that's when the EGL is parallel to the AGL. 
and parallel to the bottom of the channel at slope at zero. But if things are non-uniform, those wouldn't be uh, totally parallel. All right. Uh, Robert, are there any questions that uh, came in and, and something that's uh, more about hydraulics or are they uh, about the webinar and our technical difficulties? Well, Basam, at this time, I see no questions. Okay. And um, hopefully that's a good sign that everyone's tracking along and everything. Maybe. So just give you a reminder just to insert your questions at any time and uh, we can have another Q&A session at the end. Thank you, Robert. So I'll move on to the next concept, which is the fruit number. Uh, fruit number is an important dimension number that you use in open channel flow. If you know about the pressurized flow, you know that you use Reynolds number. That's only for pressurized flow. For uh, open channel flow, you only use fruit number. And it's defined by the ratio of inertial force to gravitational force. It comes down to a simple equation, which is the ratio of velocity to the square root of g, which is gravity or gravitational acceleration, times the hydraulic depth. Sometimes in, book you see, in books you see y. Do not use y except in the simple case of rectangular channel or very wide channel. That's only when you use y. But you cannot use y in full number for any other shape, trapezoidal, circular, triangular, or uh, natural uh, channel. You cannot use y. It has to be the hydraulic depth. Please do not make that mistake. So, because the hydraulic depth is not always Y. Most of the time it's not Y except in the case of rectangular or very wide channel. The hydraulic depth is defined by the area over top width. Top width, a few slides ago, it was mentioned there as like a, a term. You can look at the rectangular channel, the top width is like the bottom width. But for trapezoidal channel, the top width is larger than the bottom width. And uh, it's more uh, even interesting uh, to find it for circular pipe. So that's the definition of fruit number. We're gonna need it in a second. And uh, this one place, for example, when you need the fruit number is when we are classifying the flow. When you hear, sometimes you hear the word subcritical or supercritical or critical. So how do you know if your flow is, uh, the flow in the channel is critical or subcritical or supercritical? Well, first we have to refer to something called critical depth. The critical depth is different than normal depth. The critical depth uh, in a channel, we're gonna see how you can compute it uh, in the next slide, but for now, it's a depth above which the flow is subcritical. So if your uh, actual depth in the channel is above this theoretical value called YC, then you know uh, it's subcritical. If it's below that value, it's supercritical. And then this table might help, you, might help you further. Let's see what it says. If the depth Y is equal to that critical uh, value, that means the flow is critical, and the fruit number will be one. But if the depth is higher than that critical value, they call it subcritical because the fruit number is less than one. You are not at that critical stage. The fruit number is less than uh, that, and that's what it means that the, you have a slow, tranquil flow in your channel. So the depth Y is relatively large. That means it's larger than YC. So when the depth is larger than YC, the velocity is small. That's why I'm saying here it's the flow is slow and tranquil. And when the velocity is slow, the uh, water depth is large. And uh, the way how you can find that in a lab or in the field, you can throw a paddle or do any disturbance to your surface, maybe by throwing a stone. And you can see that the waves on the surface propagate downstream and upstream when you have subcritical flow. But when you look at a river flowing and very uh, easy flow, slow, tranquil, and you throw a pebble in there without harming any fish or frogs, please. So you end up seeing the uh, waves propagating upstream and downstream. But when you have critical flow, which you may uh, hardly be able to see in nature, you may be able to reproduce it in a lab, and you throw a uh, pebble or do a disturbance on the top, the, uh, the waves propagate in a radial way, radially around the uh, stone. And the supercritical case is when the depth is very small, smaller than the critical depth. So your fruit number ends up to be larger than one. It could be two, four, seven, eight, nine. And the flow is very fast. It's called rapid flow because the depth is very small. So your flow ends up to be very fast. It's when you see, let's say, a flow on a street after a rain. Let's say you are walking uphill and you see the water coming down very fast and you don't want to step in that water. 
because it could knock you off your feet. That's supercritical flow. When you have supercritical flow in a small stream, do not step in that water. When you have it on the street, do not step in it because it can really uh, cause you to fall. So, uh, and if you throw a disturbance on the top, all the waves go downstream because the way, uh, velocity of the flow is very fast. But how you find that critical depth? You might have seen that lower equation here, yc equal cubic root of q squared over g. You only use that in rectangular channels. You cannot use it for other shapes. So the top equation is what you should use all the time to find uh, critical depth. Uh, so you can either uh, solve for critical depth from fruit number equal one equation. You can set it up in function of yc. Or uh, I have transformed that into this shape, q squared times the top width over gravity uh, times uh, area cubed should be equal to one. But the top width and the area are written in function of that YC. If you go back to the diagrams of the cross section, trapezoid or rectangular, you can see how you write the top width and the area in function of Y. But in this case, you call it YC because you are solving for YC. And the only unknown here is YC, the critical depth. And you have to solve it by trial and error or using a spreadsheet or program app calculator. We're not going to go through the solution now, but you can try that on your own for an example. Now, what you hear the word sometimes, if you have seen open channel flow hydraulics before uh, taking a class, you hear the words NDL and CDL. Let's see what they mean. The NDL basically is the normal depth line, and like the name says, it's the line that shows the normal depth in the channel. So what you see in that line is I'm telling you when I draw the line which is parallel to the slope of the channel, it's the line that defines where the normal depth, in, uh, depth happens, either according to Y01, that means normal depth at point one. Whereas in the other channel, which is, has a smaller slope, even though this one is mild, but this one is milder, you have a different YN. Because every time you change the slope, remember in many equation, when you change the slope or N or anything, you get a new uh, YN number. So you can see for those two channels when they meet, the YN changes from a smaller YN to a larger YN. But the critical depth for a channel like that, if you only change the slope, because you just saw earlier that the equation for critical depth does not depend on the slope, the critical depth remains the same. And the line defining the uh, YC, showing you what YC is, is called CDL or critical depth line. And you can see here, to, uh, for the flow to pass from this NDL to the other NDL, it has to go through a curve that we are going to discuss later when we talk about non-uniform flow. In this case, this curve is called M1. But there are uh, many other uh, curve names that we'll discuss in a, in a in few slides. So uh, how do you define whether a channel is mild versus steep? You don't look at the channel in, the, uh, in nature and say, this is mild or this is steep. Yes, sometimes you could guess it right, but if I change the flow enough, you may end up thinking a channel is mild, but then it behaves as steep if the flow, let's say, is large enough. So it's not just about looking at the slope to guess whether it's uh, mild or steep. You have to do some calculations. And uh, typically on a mild slope, the uh, normal depth line or NDL is higher than the CDL because YN is higher than YC. That's what defines a mild slope. And uh, when you have uniform, uniform flow on mild slope, it's always subcritical. That means uh, the fruit number is less than one. But you can see subcritical flow on a mild slope only under non-uniform flow conditions like you are going to see in the examples there. But typically, normally, when you let the channel flow as uniform, uh, it's subcritical on a mild slope. On the other hand, steep slope, uh, you have the normal depth of some YC. That means the NDL is lower than the CDL on steep slope. And for uniform flow cases, uh, uh, supercritical flow happens on a steep slope. But on occasionally, supercritical flow could happen in non-uniform flow cases. And it's always you want to know whether you are dealing with a mild slope channel or steep slope channel uh, in order to be able to find out which non-uniform flow curve you are going to use. Uh, those profiles that I'm going to show in, uh, uh, now, I'm going to talk about now. So now we are moving from uniform flow to non-uniform flow. We are still talking about steady, something that's not changing with time, but now it's non-uniform changing with space. 
and non-uniform can be gradually varied or rapidly varied. Let's first start with gradually varied flow. For gradually varied flow, you have different surface water profiles that I'm going to show on the next slide. But one thing you have to remember when you hear the words M1, M2, M3, S1, S2, S3, do not get confused with them. First, you have to know whether you are on a mild slope. If you are on mild slope, you cannot have S1 or S2. On a mild slope, you see the M here. That means you are going to have M here, M1, M2, or M3. Steep slope, same thing. You are going to have S1, S2, S3. Critical, horizontal, adverse, you can have only C2 or C3, H2 or H3, or A2 or A3. So uh, first, you have to know what kind of slope you have. Then you end up with three cases, if it's mild, M1, M2, or M3. Then you come to diagrams like this, you can find online or in any, any textbook, and you can see that for the M1 case, the MDL, usually the flow was flowing along the MDL, but then for some reason, let's say if you put a dam or a sluice gate at the end, the flow wanna become horizontal. So it's diverging from the MDL and becomes horizontal. And that kind of curve, we call it M1. And here on the right side, you see the example. If I put here a, Sluice gates or a dam, I block the channel, then you form a reservoir behind the dam. And the reservoir looks more like uh, horizontal. And that's what you call a one curve. But on the other hand, if the flow is flowing uniform and then it's dropping down for some reason, uh, then it's going through an M2. Okay? And the M3 is if it's super critical on a mild slope. You have a mild slope, you know that. And I said, in some cases, you can have supercritical flow on the mild slope, but it doesn't last long. So the flow is coming from under the sluice gate, so it's very uh, small depth. It has to be supercritical for a while, but then it cannot sustain itself. It cannot stay supercritical, because normally for a mild uh, slope, you have to have a subcritical flow. Your normal flow is subcritical above the CDL line shown here in, uh, in dots or in uh, dash. So to go from supercritical to uh, normal flow, which is subcritical, you have to go through a hydraulic jump that we are going to talk about in a few minutes. So the, uh, those are a couple of examples uh, of M1, M2, M3. Same thing for S1, S2, or S3. You can look at them on your own time. Or for the other uh, curves, A1, sorry, A2, A3, H2, A3, or uh, C2, C3, you can look at them in, uh, online if you want to see examples of when they happen. Those water surface profiles. Now we talked about the gradually varied, like M1, M2, M3, but sometimes we have rapidly varied. That means it happens within a short distance of time. And examples of rapidly varied flow would be like a waterfall. You have a river here, then if it's uh, falling into a plunge pool. So that change here is very rapid. It's not uh, a curve. It's not uh, uh, an M2 curve or S2 curve. It's just very rapid. It's very chaotic. Here, the, here we have air entrainment. And here, when it plunges, it's totally chaotic. It's not governed anymore by uh, Manning's equation, for example. So you, uh, uh, this rapidly varied flow uh, it will be more difficult to analyze. You wanna, uh, probably you are going to find some uh, programs that deal with it like uh, numerically uh, to be able to analyze it. It's not like a simple equation that it can give you. But then you have something called radial hydraulic jump. And that's one you can analyze, like a regular hydraulic jump. You can see it uh, at home when you open your sink and the water jet hits that point and then it goes radially. And then here it's fast, the flow, but then here it jumps. There is a jump here happening around. And then here is slower flow. So it's more subcritical. So here you have supercritical, then it jumped to subcritical. But that's happening in a radial way. But uh, most of the time you see a regular hydraulic jump in a channel. And that's something you don't want to be swimming into because you could drown because it keeps on turning here in the jump. And we're going to talk more about the hydraulic jump uh, in the next few slides. And, uh, and I'm going to try to go through them very quickly. So again, you have supercritical flow here and then the hydraulic jump happens. Then things stabilize and you end up with subcritical flow. Always the hydraulic jump goes from supercritical to subcritical, from low depth to high depth, from very high velocity to small velocity, okay? And you don't want to, of course, be caught there because you might drop. 
And uh, those are the equations governing the hydraulic jump. I won't have the time to go through them, but you can come back to that. If you know the depth at Y1 and you know the flow, you can find the depth at Y2 from this equation. Because when you have depth Y1 and from the flow and Y1, you can find the fluid number at point one at the beginning upstream of the jump, then you can compute Y2. Vice versa, if you know Y2, you can find from the flow the fluid number at two, and then you can find the depth Y1 here. And if you, in the field, you have measured Y1 and Y2, but you don't know the flow, so a good way to know the flow in the channel is around the hydraulic jump. You can go and measure Y1, go measure Y2, and then use this equation, since you know Y1 and Y2, to find fluid number at two, and from, uh, from fluid number, you can find the velocity at two, then you can find the flow at two because the flow Q is velocity times area. Okay? So a uh, hydraulic jump is a good tool to uh, measure the flow in a channel. I won't have time to go now through the advantages of uh, the disadvantage of hydraulic jump. Hopefully you'll go through them on your own. And uh, energy gets dissipated, dissipated in a jump. It's, uh, hydraulic jump is a good tool to dissipate energy. They'll say they use it at the end of a spillway. They make sure that the hydraulic jump happens before the flow goes into the channel, so you can dissipate the energy. So the flow, when it goes into a natural channel, is not going to erode it and wash out all the sediment. That's why you want to make sure the hydraulic jump, and jump happens on concrete before you go into the natural channel. And uh, that's how you compute the energy dissipation. I will skip that. And uh, specific energy concept here. Uh, this is the equation for specific energy. I have to skip it too. And here the last uh, poll question is, you have a hydraulic jump in this case, so I've gone from steep channel to a mild channel. On the steep channel, the flow is supercritical. You see the MDL here, and then uh, the normal depth in a uh, mild channel is subcritical. That's why to go from super to steep, it's, uh, there is a hydraulic jump. But now the question is, on the mild reach of the channel, that's the second one, reach B here, uh, and after the hydraulic jump, downstream of the jump, is it A, the hydraulic grade line overlaps the MDL? Does the hydraulic grade line, HGL, does it coincide with the MDL? Or does it coincide with the CDL, option B? Or you cannot tell from uh, this diagram and the information I gave you. Or the HGL does not exist with hydraulic jump. Which one is your answer? A, B, C, and D. Look at the diagram, think about it, and then after a few seconds, we'll switch to Robert. Robert will take over and will allow you to click A, B, C, or D. All right, take about another 30 seconds. Just determine your selection, and then I'm going to launch the poll, and you'll be able to input your selection. Give you a few more seconds for that. All right, I'm going to launch the poll. There you go, in the mild channel shown below and just after the hydraulic jump. The HDL overlaps the NDL, the HGL overlaps the CDL. Cannot tell from the given information or D, the HGL does not exist with the hydraulic jump. I see the answers coming in. Good. Right. Give you another five seconds. I'll be closing the poll in five, four, three, two, and one. Closing the poll. I'm going to show the results now. 
see the majority chose option A, which is the HDL overlaps the MDL, and this time the majority is right. The AGL, like we said earlier, uh, is the hydraulic grade line, and that's basically along the water surface. Uh, always goes along the water surface because it's the depth Z plus the, uh, sorry, the elevation Z plus the water depth Y. So AGL defines the water surface. And since in this diagram, uh, if uh, Robert can we go back to the, uh, the slide I have. So we can see uh, if you said the AGL or, uh, is the water surface, and this diagram shows you after the jump, water is at uniform depth. It's along the NDL. So since the water is along the NDL, that means the AGL is along the NDL, and the correct answer was A. Uh, good job, everyone. And the last slide is about HECRAS. You have probably heard of HECRAS, and maybe you are using HECRAS. And some people think, why do I know about, why do I need to know about mass equation and conservation of uh, mass and energy and momentum? And all of that, since HECRAS can give me all the results I need. Well, HECRAS was developed by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, and it's a one-dimensional uh, software. Uh, it allows for one-dimensional study analysis, uh, but also it allows, uh, recently they added a 2D feature. It can do 1D and 2D on study hydraulics, and uh, can do also water temperature analysis, water quality modeling, all these are new features. But if we stick with the first one, which is 1D analysis, you can do it using the equations I gave you, but you could use uh, sometimes a crash if things are more complicated. You have many changes of slope, of cross section. You don't want to keep on uh, uh, doing that manually. But it's important to understand the basic of hydraulics. So when you look at your answers in a crash, the results, the output results, you analyze them. You want to see whether that makes sense. You want to see whether what you put in there made sense. You, can, you got uh, good output results or not. So that's why it's important to understand the background before you go ahead and use HECRAS. So yes, uh, you can use HECRAS and don't worry about uh, solving mass equation, but it's important to understand the basic of hydraulics so you can better interpret the results of in, uh, a software like HECRAS. And uh, with that, uh, uh, here's my contact information if you need to reach me, and uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions from the audience. All right. Uh... I have no questions, and it's fitting because we're out of time. And uh, But if you do have some questions or you think of some later, you can contact Basab, or you can contact me, and we'll, I'll get those questions to Basab, and he will uh, send you an email or something to answer your questions. Again, he's making himself available to talk about this stuff. And we want to thank all of you uh, for, for joining us today. I want to thank Bassam for presenting such a great information and sharing his great experience with us. And I want to thank all of you for joining. We want all of you to please stay tuned for other Baywork events. Also, we invite you to visit our website at baywork.org. Please know that the recording of this webinar will be posted at Baywork within the baywork.org within the next two weeks. Additionally, we will e email contact our certificates to those who answered yes to the questions regarding them on the registration form. Lastly, we really want to know your thoughts about this webinar. Please take a moment to complete the survey you will receive immediately after we are done. It's only three questions. Do you have any final words, Basan? Uh, Thank you, uh, Robert and Pamela, for the opportunity to present this webinar uh, with uh, Baywork. And uh, I hope uh, that attendees have uh, benefited from something, learned something new. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully, I, uh, the information I gave was not too much. In uh -huh. hour, but <laughs> what right. can I do? It's a big topic, and uh, we just scratched the surface. Well, looking at everything, it seems like everyone was, no, maybe not everyone, but a sufficient amount of people were following along and got something out of it. We appreciate you doing this today, Basam. And on behalf thanks, of folks. Baywork, great. on behalf of Baywork, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Please have a great rest of the day and the rest of the week. Until next time, goodbye.